Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and my new segment where I chat and interview with other pet professionals about a variety of topics, dog training, dog care, dog health, dog nutrition, dog rescue, dog whatever. I try to keep in line with the content on my channel and uh, I started this segment a few weeks back and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having so much fun with this segment, getting to talk to other pet professionals on a variety of topics and uh, today, I have with me a very special guest. Uh, his name is Steve Diller. And Steve, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if this is a compliment or an indictment, but Steve's been around. <laughs> so Steve, Steve is a, is a well-renowned dog trainer. Uh, he, his experience dates back to the 70s. And uh, you know, among many things, he, you know, he author of the book, Dogs and Their People, uh, Choosing and Training the Best Pet for You. Uh, it's a great book. I'll throw the link down there. You should definitely check it out. His website, stevediller.com. And I remember, he doesn't, but I remember when I first met Steve, uh, <laughs> I was training for a number of years already, but I, uh, in the, you know, the early part of the century, I think it was around 2002, 2003, I started going to more workshops and stuff. And I met Steve in Manhattan in this workshop and I don't even remember where it was I just remember it was in a church basement and uh, which is funny because I'm a recovering alcoholic so I felt like I was going to an AA meeting uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, I remember after the meeting I ran up to you and I was like hi Mr. Diller my name is Jeff <laughs> I was like a kid in a candy shop because I heard of you and uh, I was really excited to, to meet you so um, I don't know I hope I'm not making you feel uncomfortable, but I, I don't think I ever told you that story. Um, well, getting used to feeling uncomfortable now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at any rate, Steve, I'm going to hand it over to you. Just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your, yourself. Well, um, I, I guess, it, you know, sometimes uh, uh, you pick a job, and sometimes the job picks you. And in my case, it was clearly one of those. Right. I, I didn't set out to like do what I do and become who I became. You know, I, I, I didn't have those thoughts. It's just that, I mean, I grew up in the Bronx and there wasn't a whole lot to do when I was a kid. My folks weren't exactly wealthy, had a bunch of kids. So <clears throat> my mother used to pack me up every couple of days and take me to the ASPCA on a field trip, kept me busy. So she, she pushed me in there in a carriage. You know, I, I, I don't know if she was worried about what might happen to me in there or not, but it was a frequent, it was a brown bag lunch and we're going to the ASPCA. And that was like going to Disneyland for me. You know, it was like, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I probably should have tried to do that with my own children, but you know, it's kind of a weird thing for somebody to maybe do, but however it came, it came. And so I was the one who would, you know, find dogs in the street back in those days when there were lots of dogs roaming around in the like 1960s. I would drag them home by the collar and then when they got to my door, I'd let the collar go, knock on the door, my mother would open it up and I'd say, this dog followed me home. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd say, okay, we can bring them in for lunch. You know, that kind of and many dogs came for lunch and many dogs never left. You know, that's just the way it went. She, um, Mom was a dog person, and if I brought one home, it was all good for her. It used to shock my dad when he got home from work, but he put up with it. <laughs> you know, it was just the way it was. So you know, I went to, the, to Westminster when I was a kid. I mean, I, I just had that. Those things were available to me as uh, New York things, right? Westminster, Madison Square Garden. It was, it was there. I remember going there with my parents. I went with a friend of mine and his parents. And you, I was exposed to the dogs a lot. Well, that's, I mean, that's probably, I mean, that's one of the reasons why you came on today. I mean, I, I guess that would be a good segue to, I guess, to focus more on the topic of the, the state of dogs and dog training in the current world, you know, because I mean, obviously, and you know, you, you talked about your journey and now, you know, what, what's your take? What's the state of dogs and dog training today? I think that we haven't moved along that much in some ways is because we still have some of them and some of these that are way apart. And then we do have the independents, I would call them, if we speak politics, you know. Right, right. You know, you got your right wing and your left, but you got a lot of independents. And there's, there's room within that to be a little more conservative or a little more liberal in the way you think and feel and behave. So 
if I had to train somebody, because I felt it was really the right thing and it was necessary to work a leash and a collar, I feel comfortable with my ability with a leash and a collar because I, I years of that. I'm not going to like be like knocking a dog into the middle of the next month. And I'm not going to let anybody else do that either. And if I'm going to leave them with that, with those tools, it's going to be because I know how to use them. I'm comfortable with that and confident. And I'm not going to leave them with that until I'm comfortable and confident that they know how to use the tools appropriately. Then I'm okay with this. In the meantime, since many of my clients are over here, and even if I think this is the right way to go, if I don't feel like I can give these people that, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things I, I love mostly about um, leaning more towards a positive reinforcement approach with private dog owners is they can't screw them up that much. <laughs> give them an extra piece of food, so what? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, if, if their timing is a little off, all right, you, you might – inadvertently reward a little excitement or you know you might not hold a stay for the approach i mean not a huge deal not a not a deal breaker as it relates to relationship right 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 and that's a big deal so sometimes you feel you, you're really better off over here with at least with my clientele i find this is the place to, to really i'm going to start here with everybody and if I have clients that have big expectations, because, you know, that's another thing that, like, for us, do you need the dog to recall from a squirrel or a deer or another dog? Or is that less important in your world? You know, because if it's not that important, then maybe we don't have to do things that you don't want to do. But if it becomes really important, then we may have to go there in order to achieve that. Right. I don't know till we go there, but from experience alone, I'm going to say that when a dog is in drive, really focused and moving, and you want to try and interrupt that, I don't think my chicken hasn't worked. You know, <laughs> I'm as a Purdue man. You know, I mean, I'm going for the good stuff. But you know what? Now nah, there's a squirrel. It's moving. I'm moving. And Steve, if you're not going to help me catch this squirrel, shut up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna use food it's got to be big enough where you could throw it and hit the dog <laughs> well, in case, that's what they did right uh, they used to wrap it up in a chain or something and back. Yeah, they're so you know i was never much with the throw chain myself but it was something they did right keeler used a slingshot oh god he specifies by the way get a whammo slingshot right oh, he tells geez. you Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, you know, it's a much, it's a, a nicer day um, now when, in the way we go about our, our stuff. And I think that the end goal is very important and it's important to know that from the beginning so that you can help your client. Now, if you're a dog trainer and you have none of this stuff from the other side, from, the, from back in the day when that was the stuff for however many years it was, you need that, but you don't have those skills yourself. What do you say to the client? We can't do that. Don't do that. I'll tell you what they say. They say, well, this is a behavior that we should probably manage, which when I hear that, when someone says they need to manage it, and granted, if we're talking about aggression or like resource guarding, I am all for management for safety reasons. Um, but for, you know, counter surfing. Yeah, I mean, there you go. I mean, they won't train a dog to stay off the counter. They say it's your fault for leaving the sandwich up there. That's yeah. what I've heard that. That kind of makes me laugh. Yeah. I wouldn't have a job if that was if I told everybody that. You know, just manage the dog. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, we got to teach the dog not to do that. And do you have to be a monster when you do it? No, no. But it will require a correction of some sort. Maybe it's that can that sprays air with the electric eye on it. Maybe that's enough to get a dog off the counter. Probably not a lab, but you know, there are a lot of dogs out here. Oh no, you know, there's something scary up there. I'm not doing it. But there are lots of different devices that one could look into that would actually make a correction. You're not even in the room and the dog learns to avoid the countertop. Is that so bad? With no association to the owner. No so. association. It's all about the behavior. Right. Not the 
dog and the owner, but about the dog and the behavior. Mm-hmm. I don't see a problem with that. Yeah. I, and I, I tell my clients often, I said, you know, when we, when we get into operant conditioning and I'm like, I'm like, look, your dog could hit all four corners of the operant conditioning quadrant with you not even at home. <laughs> so. Well, it's about consequences. They occur, yeah. right? Yeah. They if you, and and I mean, in all, in all fairness, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk negatively about either side, but especially the old school traditional trainers, they really gave consequences and corrections a bad rap, and for very good reason. And I mean, even when I first started in the early '90s, you know, I, 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 I'm uncomfortable with some of the things that I used to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. but I, I think that, like you said, there's, you know it's situational and it's an individual dog thing and an individual owner thing. I just, you know, when someone tells me or when someone criticizes the use and the harm in a squirt bottle, if you squirt a dog in the ass when it jumps on the counter and they tell me how cruel that is, I can't, that I have, I just can't comprehend that as cruel. I I comprehend that as positive punishment. I squirt the dog in the ass, he jumps off and I praise him. End the story. Um, you know, but, and I think, you know, again, getting back to the subject, I guess, of today, the state of dogs and dog training is, um, I think it's, a, I think it mirrors society. And I'm not sure you feel about that in that sometimes we get so passionate about what we believe. I think our minds start to close and then it causes friction among our colleagues. Well, you know, it's difficult to try to talk to somebody who doesn't want to hear it. Right. So unless you're open minded enough to at least listen, pay attention and watch. Um, I don't, it, you can only win by learning, you know, I mean, and that's something in our profession. I think that is a constant should be anyway, a, a, a constant thing. Learn, learn, learn. What about um, the, that Bob Bailey? You know him. The chicken guy. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bailey, you know, um, he and his wife, Marion, they ran this chicken training camp and stuff. And so every semester I would show my kids, he had this five disc set. And I watched the same three of the five year, semester after semester. And every year, something else like just stuck to my head, you know, like, wow, I forgot about that little piece. Everything that he would say was just so wise. Um, You know, he became one of my heroes, and and especially when he said, punishment should only be used in in experienced hands. He didn't say never. He said, punishment is for the people who know how, not for the newbie. And if you teach by punishment, we can say there's something wrong with your training. And so that's a pretty powerful thing to say because there are people who believe that you train everything from avoidance, right? You want to avoid the correction? Sit, you know. But I'm going to go with that. You know what? If you can train sit without banging the dog, that's what you should be doing. You can train anything without banging the dog. That's what you should be doing. And when do you reserve banging at the dog? When you have killed yourself to train the dog appropriately, you know the dog understands these things because you've been through it up and down, inside and out and sideways. You know the dog knows it and you get to a place where the dog's like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Now there's that great California trainer named Michael Ellis who I like a lot. He basically said, oh, I used to think that the dogs were just telling me they were flipping me off, you know, I'm like, I'm not not doing it. And the longer I do it, he says, the more I realize maybe I just dropped the motivator. I I dropped the motivator. I needed to bring more motivation to the exercise. And I love that. I love that. He turned it on himself. And I love that. And that's what we all should be doing a little bit, regardless of where you are. Right. Turn it on because if you're not getting the results, it's not them, it's us. Mm-hmm. So, there was the time when the method there was a method and you had to use the method. If you weren't using the method, you were a quack. Um, and now it's sort of moved over to a new method. But if you don't use the method, you're a quack. It's like, wait a minute, when did how did that happen? 
How did that happen? Let it, it, they all are in quacks. You know, everybody's interested in trying. Um, it's just trying to find the golden middle. And, and if we talk about the state of dogs, they're not the same. Dogs have changed. There's such a drastic like, difference in dogs because of how, what we've been doing all these years. So from, just from when I was a kid from the 60s till now, I mean, when I used to go visit the, the ASPCA, I'll tell you what it looked like. There was the male dogs on this side and the female dogs on that side. And two, they had huge open areas with access to the outdoor pens. All the boys here, all the girls. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, and I'd look in there and you know what kind of dogs were in there every time I would go there? This is week after week, collies. I'm talking like rough collies, right? Shepherds sporting dogs you know there were all kinds of breeds which got me like, insanely interested in the breeds um but that's what i would see week after week you go to the with the cats there were all these purebred cats in there persians and siamese and all that what's going on here you know what's but because tv right so when i was a kid there was lassie and rin tin tin what are you going to find in the shelter lassie and rin tin tin that just didn't work out to be lassie or rin tin tin <laughs> right <laughs> And, and that's, that has perpetuated throughout time. Every time some new movie comes out, you see a spike in the breed of choice for a particular movie. There it goes. And so, you know, there was, but just the way they housed them. There was no separate, you're in a cage, you're in a cage. They were grouped. Mm -hmm. All the boys over here, all the girls over here. And it didn't seem to me like the dogs had a real option as to whether or not they were going to get along. They <laughs> just seemed to. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. But we, course they were a little different in the first place um and you know certain breed types do tend to behave different ways right so you know hounds like pack dogs you know they like to hang with dogs you know sled dogs they don't really kind of mind other dogs you know they like, they like being around them on some level right not not to the tune some people think but <laughs> you know they don't they, they like seeing somebody over there it's like you know all right yeah they're go. more social than other breeds <laughs> right. but and, and if you get a bunch of breeds that are more likely to be that way, then, you know, maybe this going to get along. But, you know, you take a bunch of terrier dogs of any terrier, I don't care, from the smallest to the biggest, and you try and put them together like that, all the boys, all the girls, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> we're going to have a big problem. So, you know, things have changed um, in everything we do when it comes to dogs. I mean, and, and we keep saying we're doing it for the better, and I'd like to think we do try to do that. Um, and clearly dog training is evolving constantly dog, dogs themselves there's the ups and the downs if you look at the there's a lot of videos and internet stuff about what a bulldog looked like in like 1939 it had legs yeah yeah it had a muzzle you know i mean it wasn't but it had a muzzle right. you know so that's changed and now I think they're trying to go backwards a little bit now because they kind of realize that they mucked up these breeds so bad, you know, the cavalier with the neck and, you know, everybody's got something really terrible going on. Mm -hmm. And then there's a group that says, well, we can fix that with genetic engineering. And then there are the people like, it's real easy. Just throw a mixed breed in there and let's get it done. You know what I mean? <laughs> Back to the Darwin principle here and like yeah. random selection produces the hardiest type. Yeah. I will be dead before it comes around to the place where they say we shouldn't breed for working characteristics at all we should be breeding to produce pet dogs because that's what the majority of people are looking for if you're going to produce working mentalities and characters and put them in pet homes we're going to continue to have problems yeah, it's it's the biggest. It's been one of the biggest challenges that I've I've always faced in my entire career, and it's still evident today. Where and we've talked about this on the forum, um, you know that it's just you know people they get these dogs for looks, and it's just a mismatch. It's a disaster. You know, if, it's, you, if you can produce a Roddy that behaves like a mellow golden, <laughs> then go for it. But then maybe you'll have to call it something different because otherwise, it, historically, you know, the Romans didn't have that soft idea for a Roddy. You know, they had a different concept. So are you going to stick to the concept of, you know, a suspicious, protective dog that can do this and that? And, you know, 
not so much a pet dog, right? You're going to stick to that and st still put them out there as pet dogs. And how much can a shelter put up with? How much can people do? How much heartbreak is there involved in people getting dogs that have the correct character for their working historical situation, right? That they, they are true to their breeding and bloodline. At what point, you know, how many people are going to get their heart broken by having that dog when they just needed a friendly dog because they got it based on the look, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's forever going to be interesting. Um, I think that a lot of folks are considering that maybe the idea to change to breeding, even if you want to, if, whatever breed it is, you know, if you want to turn black Russian terriers into teddy bears, <laughs> you can probably do it in a certain number of generations. It's not going to happen in a minute. Um, I just don't see the black Russian terrier people thinking about trying something like that. Yeah, I can't see that. <laughs> it's kind of course, so people, it's like, no, we want them to be mellow, relaxed, you know, real nice with kids and stuff. It's like, Get a golden retriever. You know, <laughs> or something like that. It's, you know, it's it's tough. It's rough. Uh, maybe we wouldn't even have a job if everybody knew. Um, I know that when I go out to a job, if somebody's got something like that, and I'm like, it's not the dog. Like, what the dog's doing is actually okay. But it's not okay for me, they say. And I'm like, I understand, but this is what they do. I don't want them to do that. I'm like, then why did you get this dog? Right. Well, yeah. you know. I did the research. <laughs> not really, you know, not really. Yeah. You know. Well, there's a lady around the block. She's got one just like it, you know? I went to her breeder and everything. It's like, oh God, you know, it's like, these are the things, you know, this is what we run into every day. Yeah, I get called and people call me, you know, obviously with behavior calls and, you know, I'll be talking on the phone, you know, hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I have a Rottweiler that's, that's really getting protective. And I'm like, okay, so how can I help you? <laughs> okay, tell me something I don't know, even though I never talked to you before. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. they don't want that. Yeah. yeah you, I mean, you know, it's like, why did you get that? Oh, but I did the research. I know somebody who's got a Roddy, lays on his back, lets the kids climb all over. Well, then go borrow that dog. You know what I mean? Because that's an individual, right? Yeah. That's yeah. one dog. But yeah. that's not what they were bred for, so yeah. they're not... And, they're not yeah. And the, evo the evolution of dog owners is is forever evolving. I mean, and I, I have not, you know, I have no problem with dogs becoming our family. I mean, I, I sleep with my dogs. I cuddle with them. But I, I, they're dogs. I love them. I spoil them. They eat the best food. I sleep with them. They're on the couch. We're watching movies. I mean, you name it. Um, but they're still dogs. They're still dogs. They still have to work for me every day. They have structure in their lives. And I think sometimes that gets lost, especially nowadays with this whole super lovey-dovey movement, which is great, but I think we lose sight that they're animals. Well, it's like, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with your kids, you could be friends with your kid, but you're a parent first, or you better be. Otherwise, if you're friends first, you're going to have a problem with the kid. They need the structure. Everybody needs structure. So you're right. I mean, a lot of it's gone too, way too far over. You know, this could bring me to the body harness. You know, uh, not a, I'm not a fan of the harness. You know, I feel like it's really a terrible where I can read on the internet all the injuries that dogs apparently get from collars. Then I think to myself, where was I when all these injuries were occurring? Right. Wait a minute. I was in the animal hospital environment for about 20 years that you're complaining about that all those dogs came in with like disc problems and this and that. I tell you, honest to God, I worked for orthopedic rotation. I worked for the neurology, neurology department. So all kinds of dogs with all kinds of problems, years and years and years. The only collar injuries that I ever personally really saw were people who put collars on puppies and didn't enlarge the collar as the puppy grew, and they had to surgically remove the collar from the skin. Gross yeah. and disgusting. Talk about abuse, that's abuse. Yeah. But actual from corrections, nothing. Pinch collar, too tight, cheap pinch. Seen dogs with the skin cut a little bit. 
not dogs that came in crippled because they have some collar correction thing. So, all right, if you have a brachiocephalic dog, it can't breathe at the best of times, you put a harness on the dog, I get it, you know. Most of those dogs, honestly, they're not pulling anywhere or anywhere because, you know, they can't breathe. So, you yeah. know, it's okay anyway, right? right? So, great, put a little harness on the thing. But if, if you want your dog in a harness, then you better train your dog to heal or walk on a loose leash anyway. Don't think you're going to train it on the harness. You got to train the behavior separate and then you can walk the dog on the harness. That would work out. I, I'm all for that. But to think you can train your dog because the clip is in the front or because the, the sides cut down on the dog as if that's not punishment. Are you kidding me? Plus allowing the dog to pull, causing opposition reflex and at the same time causing the dog to pull. It's like, this makes me crazy. It makes me crazy. I'm like, oh, no, no. It's, it's, but they're, they're out there. They're, they're spruing that stuff. And I'm like, I, I need to see, you better show me some records or something. You know, and I think you're going to have to dig long and hard to find a couple of cases where there was actually a neck injury based on the many thousands and millions of dogs that we're talking about over the years that didn't get injured. What are we talking about here? And, you know, now I see that it's a little bit with the remote. You know, it's not a tool I use every day, but I think if you use it humanely, it's a good tool. I, don't know. I may also agree you shouldn't be selling it to just a person over the counter who can, doesn't know how to use it, who can really hurt a dog with it. But I think it's a tool that has merits. You know, do you want to use it all the time? No, it's just a tool, just like anything else. You got to train the dog. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I haven't trained nearly as many dogs as you, but between my training career and then, you know, my wife and I, we've been in rescue since 2002. And the only time I've seen, uh, you know, injuries associated with a tool, and I'm not, I mean, not just the bad tools that people post on the internet, harnesses, regular collars, it was, it all stemmed from, and you hit it right on the head, usually uh, skin overgrowth, where the embedded collars, things along those lines. And then the only other time I've seen um, prong collars specifically cause injury, and it wasn't for training. They tied dogs out on a prong collar. I mean, that's not, that's, yeah, the, I don't care how dull those tips are. If you get a powerful dog running to the end of that line, shit's going to go wrong. <laughs> yeah. But, and then, you know, every once in a while over the course of my career, if I had to use a prong collar or a martingale or something like that, and a dog had like skin condition, I would have to rethink my approach and use something else just because we weren't hurting the dog, but because they had like some skin thing going on, we had to do something else. Right. Yeah, I've never seen, and, and you know, all they do, the opposition, uh, all they do is Google and po and they find pictures of something. No one has actually ever seen for i 've never talked to anyone who has seen firsthand an injury an injury directly related to dog training proper dog training I should say <laughs> right well, you know this is the thing i don 't you know I just beating down the tools I, I I actually had a little relationship with the people from Herm Springer in Germany because well first of all, I wanted them to make a head halter which sort of blew their minds because, you know, they said to me, you know, we're chain people. We <laughs> and I said, I know you make metal. I'm like, you know, I'm just saying a piece of that head halter may be his metal, you know, but I think you could get a really nice bridge, you know, nose piece, maybe soft leather, padded, you know, something really nice, fancy, the way you guys do it, you know. And then they started sending me, like, prototype collars and stuff, you know, that they, it was, it was, we had a very nice, they, they were lovely. They're like, oh, the collar simulates the bite from the mother's neck. I'm like, that's a long shot, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, and I mean, if you guys believe it, okay, but you know, nah. But they, they're nice people, they, they're interested, they, they make horse equipment, they're into that stuff. I don't think anybody who manufactures these things for the most part is into hurting a dog, you know? I mean, and I don't like that the, 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 the these statistics that come up about, well, there's a shot collar and this. I mean, if you I think you can actually, just in terms of shock corrections, I think that it's more risky when you have uh, invisible containment than actually 
handler use of a remote. Because, I mean, I've seen with my own eyes dogs that became kind of testy and aggressive because they were contained by, in some sort of underground containment. And there were a lot of people on the street going by. And when the dogs initially would run down there excited, they ended up getting shocked and they paired the shock with the passerby. But that's similar to the dog that sits in the window, no shock collar, no nothing, barks in the window, the passerby keeps going, and the dog says, I scared them away, right? I'm going to eat these people if I ever get out that door because they're afraid of me because I scare them away every single day, including the postman, right? the, the UPS guy, <laughs> all yeah. that stuff. It has nothing to do with the shock. Right? It's about timing and what's going on. You know, there's all that. You there's know, a lot to it, yeah. The seed, you, know, you know, we could go there. But you know, it's not necessary, but it's a bigger, it's like you say, if you give a dog a piece of food and bad timing, big, no big deal. But if you whoop his, his rear end, you know, and he didn't deserve it and it was bad timing, there's going to be some relationship problems right then and there. Yeah. So the dog in the window, he's going to bark, scare him away. It's not good for this dog. He's practicing bad behavior. He's practicing territorial aggression. And, you know, it's not great. But if you add a shock to the dog's already harried and hectic mindset, yeah, you're really planting something in there that's difficult to pop back out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. This is where it's not so much about the tools. You've got to be thoughtful about how you use your stuff. You know, so this, the state of dog training has drastically changed in many ways and yet stayed the same on, on different levels, right? Dog trainers, the change seems to be continuing on. It's just I hate for it to be changing from make-believe statistics of preying on people's fears. If you do what this person says, you're going to mess your dog up. That's really not fair because if this person who told you to do it is good at it and they're giving you good advice and instruction, this person shouldn't be like having that talk with them, I don't think. If, this, if the client comes to you later and says, I used this guy, I didn't like his approach, whatever, it didn't seem to work for me, then great, you got him. But don't beat on this guy and, and if there's nothing really wrong going on, right? If, if it's just the way you feel is contrary to the way this person feels, then respect them and they should respect you. And I think that's how we, you and me, I think we feel that way. So if, if, the, if our profession cannot come to that, we're not going to really grow, I don't think. You know, we and need to get together. That's one of my biggest concerns is... Um, the emotional aspect of how some of the next generation of dog trainers, um, you know, again, they're, they're putting like human emotions and internet propaganda into a formula that it, where it just doesn't belong. Um, you know, I mean, if, if someone is, is using tools and is abusive, shout at the rooftop, get them to stop. Um, but if you, you know, if, if you're seeing a, a, a trainer work a dog, you know, like when people see a, a, a trainer walking the dog, whether it's a gentle leader, a halty, a, a pinch collar, even, even no pull harnesses are frowned upon by some people in the dog training community. Mm -hmm. Like if you're just seeing them walk by, you have no idea where, where they are in their process. Like, you know, you don't know if that's their sixth or seventh session and they're doing really well. And the dog, you might see a dog pulling a little bit, but six weeks earlier, that dog couldn't even be on a leash. Like, you don't know. You so, don't. But you're gonna judge them? You know, and I, I'm like, and it's funny, because when I, when I do work down here with the rescues, like, I, part of me providing videos to my clients is to show them how jacked up their dogs were <laughs> when they got here. Because it's not perfect when they leave me. I'm, I have them for a short period of time. You know, they're not perfect, but they're on their way. Um, and I, you know, and I, I think that's, sometimes we lose sight of that too is, and, and both sides, the traditional center trainers, you know, force-free trainers. Uh, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that uh, my dogs are six and seven years old. I still work them. Like it doesn't end doesn't end it doesn't it, you want to oh you got a pit you got a puppy kindergarten certificate 
good for you. You know what that means? Nothing. <laughs> Let's talk about first grade. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I mean, you know, in, in all fairness, obviously, I, I think you would agree with this. When we're, when we're And we're talking, you know, pet dog training, right, which is a lot different than working dog training. Um, you know, but pet dog trainers, pet owners, you know, what happens is we help them. They, we have an idea where we want the dog to go, but the owners, they get the dog to a point where they accept it. And they don't really go any further because – the dog is fine. It's not perfect, but it's fine. Or sometimes it's the other, like, I'll tell you, I, I got a call today from a police officer that I did some work with, um, with his first detection dog. Well, he, he didn't really need me much until he wanted to compete in the police dog trials. And so he didn't have any idea of what the competition dogs look like. Right? He's working a, a, a nose dog anyway. A lot of the patrol dogs were better at that stuff because they needed more obedience. It wasn't just go find. It was like, you know, heal and like that. So I went and, you know, we worked on focused eye contact and that stuff. He did very well. Awesome cop, amazing dog. He lost it. But he called me today and he said, we, my family uh, took in a German Shepherd puppy. I said, do you have a new detection dog? He goes, I do. I'm like, okay, now, he's, now we're bringing in a shepherd puppy. He said, I said, how old is it? He said, it's about six months old. And I said, how's that going? He says to me, well, he can foos, right? He's talking German to the dog. He can foos, but he doesn't come all the time when I call him. So I asked him, I said to him, are you really calling him? Like, come, right? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, why would you do that? When he, you're not in a position to help him be successful. You know, you're wasting a word. You know, shouldn't you be in the area of identifying existing behavior and rewarding that? And he said, uh-huh. When are you available? He said to me. I said, what, can you bring the dog to work? He goes, yeah. I'm going to meet him at the police station tomorrow. I'm going to tune him up. It's the other way around. He always got adult dogs to start with that already were like kind of halfway there. All he had to do was basically trained scent behavior, which in a, in a lab is a pretty easy deal, you know. Um, and now he gets a puppy, shepherd. No foundation. And he's on it. He's on he, <laughs> so I'm like, he could foos. He's six months old. Foos my ass, foos. No. You know, what are you doing to the puppy? I got to go over there and save his life tomorrow because, you know, I, it's the other way. Yeah. Some people don't do enough. And then there are some people who do way too much too soon because – they're looking for the sprint rather than the marathon that it truly is, right? So yeah. I'm going to get him all prepared for the long haul tomorrow. Right. But it's a funny thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you, um, we have to wrap things up here, but, I mean, do you have any final thoughts, um, you know, whether you want to offer some tidbits to dog trainers or dog owners and uh, the future of dog training and dog ownership? Well, I think the best that you can do would be to, uh, if you're a dog trainer and you're not getting your hands on enough like varied cases, it'd be nice to go to the shelter wherever you live and like volunteer a day and you know, ask them if you, you can and whether or not it would be okay to like hang with some of the dogs that they're having issues, you know, maybe some of the excitable dogs, you know, different things. Just get your hands on as many dogs as you can because Training all the different breeds is, uh, it really brings a lot of wealth to your knowledge because they're all different. You know, you're not going to train down in a toy pool the same way you're going to do it in a, in a winery. You know, you, you got to approach these dogs differently. So how do you know that? Well, get your hands on enough of them and you're going to figure that out pretty quick, you know, and then the individual is one thing, but you're going to look at size and type. It's going to help your training. So the more you train, the better off you are. I would say stop taking cases you're not prepared for. I mean, a lot of people just take it because, you know, they need the money and all that, but, you know, that's not healthy. It's bad for everybody if you do that. Um, if, you, if you feel like it's beyond you, refer it. If you don't have a referral base of other trainers, behavior people, and folks like that, develop one because they'll appreciate the referrals. And believe me, you will get referrals back. So you're not losing something by referring something out if you feel like it's over your head. It's the smartest thing you can do. It makes you look good. And you'll, you'll always look good if you speak nicely 
about your competition. Right? You're not going to ever look good if you have something bad to say. If your client says something bad about the other guy, you, you, get, you know, you can't tell him to stop talking, but you can let it go in one ear and out the other. You don't have to add anything to what they have to say. Just do your job, do it well, and that'll make the rest of us look good. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough? That is. That is very fair. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's been awesome. I appreciate the chat. Um, you know, and it's, if anyone, uh, I, don't, I, I had a, my, our other friend, David Stagg was on one, one of my other segments, but, uh, Steve is also part of the, the forum that we do every couple of weeks with dog trainers connection. So definitely check them out and I'll throw that information down below as well. Uh, in case anyone wants, wants to take a peek over there at the dog trainers connection channel. Uh, and you'll be able to see Steve and David and a couple of other trainers as well. So, um, and you know, listen, if this is your first time here on my channel, take a peek around. If you like what you see and you want to stay up to date on dog training, dog care, dog health, dog nutrition, dog rescue, dog, whatever, consider subscribing to my channel, click that bell. So you get notified when I upload new content. And uh, again, thanks, Steve. I appreciate you coming by and we'll see you guys soon. Every article I ever wrote, or uh, they didn't call them articles, they called them reports in school. You have to write a report. So my reports were always on dogs, you know, I mean, until so they started to tell me to pick something else, you know, could you write about something else? I had a, a fifth grade teacher, Mr. Minogue, he was a rough guy. And he came to me once and he goes, enough with the dogs. You have to write about something else. So I asked him what I could write about. And he said, try sports. So I wrote about racing greyhounds. Because that's, <laughs> <laughs> that was the best I could do, Jeff. You know, I mean, really, because that's who I was. Yeah. So when, when I, I have to go to work, I mean, what does a person do when you, when time to get a job? You know, I mean, school didn't really prepare me for any kind of job. So I took a job um, at, a, at a pet store that sold puppies in New, New York City. And, uh, I remember going there and they showed me the ropes. I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I listened to them sell puppies. Like, this Iris Setter puppy right here, you don't have to worry. It doesn't need any exercise. It'll be fine in an apartment. You know, I'm listening to it. So by the end of like the first week, I was already like, I don't think I could stay here. And I had a, an appointment with my own veterinarian for my own dog. And when I went into the animal hospital, I thought, what do I have to lose? So I asked the doctor, got any positions available here? He asked me if I was observant. I said, I'd like to think so. He said, I'll send you to the manager. Went to the manager. We had a little chat. He goes, okay, I'll take you in. I'm like, great. He said, when can you start? I said, well, I have to give my other place a couple of weeks notice. I said, I hope that doesn't ruin my opportunity for getting a job. And he said, actually, it increases your opportunity because it shows that you're responsible. And I went back to the pet store and that the, the very next day and said, I'm out of here. I, I couldn't stand it. I mean, they used to Cairo syrup up the puppies in the morning. Oh, God. They'd be bouncing off the walls and the kid. They all looked healthy, but they were all sick. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't put up with that. So I got an animal hospital job. It was like late 72, early 73. And that's when I realized I might know some things about dogs, but boy, oh boy, there's a lot to know. And so it was slow going in the beginning. In 1972, 73, I kind of had hair down to here and I was all scruffy in the face. They called me Creeping Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I looked kind of odd and, and I was really kind of quiet in the way I moved around. So they called me creepy. They called me into an exam room for some handling help. And if they get on the phone and we need a handler and I'd be standing right there. I'm like, I'm here. And they're like, when did you get in here? I said, didn't you call a little couple of minutes ago? I never saw you get in here creeping Jesus, you know? So you know, it was kind of a funny thing. But I learned a lot in the animal hospital setting. And, and then I actually went to technical school to become a, a clinical laboratory technician. So it was human school, but lab work's lab work. And uh, after I completed that, they sort of bumped me up into a technician status and then put me in the lab. 
where I was amazing at hematology and clinical chemistry, parasitology. I, I had that stuff. So they put me there for about a year. I sat on a stool looking into a microscope at, at the veterinary hospital. And I got tired of that, so I complained, and they took me out, put me in radiology for a while. So they moved me around, but and it was great. I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I was working around a lot of specialists and stuff. I was working with some great technicians around me. So it was. I felt blessed to be in a, an amazing environment. And uh, then came the New York State sort of proclamating that in order to work in an animal hospital legally as a technician, you, you needed to take a test to, to have a license. You have to have a license. And while I went to school, I went to school very specifically for laboratory technical training, not veterinary technology. Back in those days, there weren't very many schools around to begin with. So um, they offered up a test, the state offered up a test, 500 people took it, 50 passed. And I was 50 out of 500. It was tough, it was, it was tough. And I was thankful that I had the, the technical training that I had and, and that I worked with the people I work with. And I was one of those lucky 50. But, and, and so my license number, by the way, is in the first 1,000 vet tech license number <laughs> in the state of New York. Once again, it kind of tells how long I'm, I'm dusty old now. You know, I'm out <laughs> crazy. So, you know, with that, um, it, the animal hospital introduced me to a, a bunch of dog training schools that were around. They used the hospital I worked in for their medical needs. And so I was around dog trainers a lot until the, the owner of one of these places called me up and said, how would you like to moonlight at my dog training facility? And I'm like, okay, what do I have to do? And he says, well, you're going to kind of keep an eye on the health and stuff of the animals. We may need this or that, or, you know, just, I said, sure, yeah, I'd love to do that. So that, that was an interesting experience working in a facility like that. They mostly train guard, guard dogs and, you know, people would come around with their pet dogs for obedience training, things like that. And I saw the two sides of dog training early on. There was the, the passion for the training, which came much from the trainers. And there was the business of dog training, which came much from the owners. And so, Hanging with the trainers was awesome because they would be yelling at me like constantly. Like they give me a leash and a strange dog. It's like, okay, let's see it. And they would be screaming at me. Really? Really? You call that timing? Really? Really? <laughs> it beat me down, but it was a healthy, a healthy beating. And in the meantime, I'm watching the owners. When we're finished with your dog, it'll do this, that, this, that, it'll write a book for you. You know, it'll drive you to work and make your coffee. It will vacuum. It will never get on the seat in the car. It'll only ride on the floor as to not dirty the seats. And I was like, wow, wow. Now I didn't work there full time. I didn't know what they were producing, but I found out real quick. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. There was none of that. And I sort of graduated up from just taking care of the dogs to where I was actually like working dogs. They would send me to the airport pick up dogs, ship dogs out. I mean, it was, it was nuts. And I went to a few of those because they all kind of were owned by, if not the same guy, relatives of the same people, more or less. So this, this, this was more of like a boarding and training facility, that kind of place? Pretty much. There no group, anything. Right. After the, they didn't offer private individual lessons. It was always, you drop off, you get them, we'll train them, and then you'll come back and we'll marry you and the training to the dog, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. So um, it, it was a fascinating, uh, like, learning experience for me. Um, went from this one to that one, and they started to have trainers courses, and they started hiring me for teaching some portions of the trainers course, where I met more folks from all over the place that they would bring in. Um, they, they actually produced some really fine trainers, uh, competition shook some people, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, as much as there was uh, a bit of a scam thing going on the, on the one hand, there was always passionate dog training going on at the same time. So, so you, you were exposed to a decent variety of not just, I'm, I'm sure not just training protocols, but also the type of dog you were training. Didn't have a choice, you know, whatever they brought. Mm. Right? So, I mean, in, the, in terms of working dogs, there was a whole lot of shepherds, Dobermans, not as many Roddies back then, but some. A bunch of Bouviers, 
you know, things like that. Yeah, which, which was cool, you know, yeah. was pretty cool, but you know, it, it's a, it fascinating. And there were a lot of dogs, you just, they would bring them in, but you couldn't really get near them. And it was fascinating for me to watch some of the more senior guys get close to some of the dogs you could not open the door to, right? I mean, it took days sometimes, of one kibble at a time through the fence, you know, this kind of thing. It was, it was interesting, it was interesting. But, and it was old school compulsion training. And so when I went from mostly vet teching to some dog training and sort of grown into mostly dog training, very little vet teching, I went to one of my old bosses and I asked him, I said, can you give me some advice for going into full-time dog training? And he said, yeah. I said, what is it? He said, well, first get a female Doberman and train her up for demonstrations. And I said to him, I'm a German Shepherd guy. And he said, I'm a German Shepherd guy too. Get a Doberman. And I said, why? And he said, cause they're fast. They, they always look good when they work. Shepherds can look a little sloppy. <laughs> Anything for you, and she'll do it fast. Yeah. He said, also, make sure it's not a real pretty dog. I'm like, why is that? He said, he reminded me then of his own demo dog, which was a little red, nasty looking female Doberman named Dum Dum. <laughs> can't make stuff up. Her name was Dum Dum, and she was a brilliant demo dog. She did a lot of, there was nothing she couldn't do. She wore a cowboy hat. She wore sunglasses. They would put a cigarette in the corner of her mouth. There'd be a lit cigarette there, sunglasses. And she'd sit in a chair in the office, just quietly sit in the chair. Yeah. I mean, it was really something else. Good protection, good everything. Um, and she was a, not a very attractive looking dog. And so he said to me, don't get a good looking dog because if the people that bring you dogs may bring in dogs that aren't quite that good looking. If your dog is beautiful and it's well-trained, their dog's never gonna look good. So you gotta get a nasty looking dog, train it up pretty good, and don't make these people feel bad, you know, like they're gonna come with things. <laughs> I, said, I, I, I couldn't believe it. this is what he's telling me. Low, lower their expectations. <laughs> Right, you know, set them up now, right? <laughs> and then he says, um, well, look, how are you going to go about this training thing of yours? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, are you going to go to their homes? Are you going to bring them in? He said, you know, we take dogs in. That's what we do. So when people come to us and ask us, well, what about those group classes some people offer? What about those private in-home sessions? I say to them, what are they going to do in an hour? Come on. It's a, you know, the dog needs intense work. What are these people going to get done in an hour, right? That's going to be my story to them. You, if you're an in-home trainer, when they say to you, what about those board and training programs? You're going to say, would you leave your little baby on the streets, like in, in the mid city somewhere, you know, or you're going to the ghetto with your baby and dropping it off. I'm like, that's what you say to them. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's kind of harsh. And he says, well, you know, you got to work your, your, your thing. And I was like, oh boy, I think I'm just going to, I hear them. I'm going to have to go about this my own way. Yeah. And off I went, right? Off I went. So, you know, my background is more medical than it was behavioral at the time. And um, when the Mercy College opened up the four-year veterinary technology program, um, my veterinary boss was the director there, and he hired me to teach the clinical portion of the laboratory course. Five-credit course. It was a big deal. Um, I did that for a bunch of years. That could be a real headache because, you know, they're kids, you know, they're college kids. They look in a microscope, they see a red blood cell. They say, Professor, what is that? I say, those are red cells. There's lots of them. You see them floating around? In <laughs> and the next day it's like, Professor, what are those? I'm like, those are red blood cells. Remember those little red blood cells? They're floating around. You see those? That's what much of what you're looking at would be. And a week later, it's the same thing. You know, it's like over and over. It's like, these are white cells. This one's a, a lymphocyte. And I mean, it was, I would come home after every class with like a splitting headache because it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot of pressure. I mean, because if, when it comes to lab work, if you report the wrong results, a patient could be really harmed, mm. right? It's got to be accurate. So 
I went to my boss again, complained again about lab work. I, you know, I've had it with the lab work. I, you put me in the lab in the hospital for a year. Now you stick me in the lab in school with these kids, right? You're making me crazy. He said, well, how do you feel about surgical nursing? I'm like, ooh, what do you got to teach there? Oh, how to make stitches, you know, how to sew, how to intubate, uh, how to use an anesthesia machine. I'm like, I'll take that. You know, so I got in there for a while. And then the animal behavior instructor who had a doctorate was going into research. And so my boss came to me, goes, you train dogs anyway, but you've been doing it all these years. How about teaching animal behavior? Don't you need a doctorate level person for that? And he goes, I don't think so. It's up to me. He said, I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put you with the doctorate level behaviorist and he's going to tell you what you need to know. And uh, we'll see if you can take that. And so I did. I went, I went to this guy. He gave me a stack of books like this. None of them were about dog training. They were all like behavior textbooks, you know, that kind of stuff. Big fat ones. So I went, you know, because it's interesting to me. So it's not like I said, oh, I don't want to do that. I was like, yeah. You know, so I really, I liked it. I did that. Read everything I needed to read. Went back. Sat with this guy for a couple hours. And asking me this and that and this and that. And then he looked at my boss and he goes, just give him the course. He's got and so they, they, I taught animal behavior for years, for years. Nice. It was cool. You know, it was cool. I'm hanging with the vet techs. I get to go to school, you know, I'm not getting hair on me. <laughs> it, it, so it was just part of my experience, you know. The, the, the book thing was because they called me. Um, I guess it, we, I took a little flack about writing a book recently from some dog trainers who were like, you know, I don't, I don't know what they think. You, you know, because people are looking like, oh, man, you're, you don't train dogs, you write books or, you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, really? Um, when I closed my actual physical training facility and I had the paperwork that I had to get rid of, I had to get a truck to come for shredding. It took like half a day. And when we counted the files, it came to the point where we realized we trained between like two and 3,000 dogs a year. Wow. That's a, that's a lot of dogs. Yeah. But it was like two classes a night, seven days a week. You know, and these were big classes, a big place. I was able to take in, you know, fair number per group, eight, ten if I had assistance. You know, I mean, so it, it built up. And, you know, they came to me to write a book. I didn't even want to do it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'd like you to write a book. I'm like, why? It was an agent, an agent called. I want you to write a book. I'm like, I don't want to write a book. Why not? Well, everything's been said. That's an interesting thing to say right now, by the way. Yeah. Um, I said that. Everything's been said. And he said, but I think you have a pitch. And I'm like, everybody's got a pitch. It's, you know, it, it, there's basically some principles to this thing. There's nothing different necessarily. And I, I, so I denied him. And he, but he kept calling. He just wouldn't stop. And he finally said to me, this is a way to get a dog trainer. Because, you know, in, in our profession, it's usually feast or famine when it comes to clients, right? And so he gets with me and he goes, you know, if you write a book, if, if you write a proposal, and we can sell your proposal. They might pay you fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars, which, by the way, was not true. But right, right. it sure sounded good on the phone. <laughs> I was like, "Well, how do you write a book proposal?" He goes, "I'm going to send you a sample. It's not that big a deal. You got to, you know, you need a title, you need a table of contents, you need to write a short blurb on each of the chapters that you plan on writing, and you need to write one chapter." We're talking about 15, 20 pages, no big deal. I said, well, I'll try it, see how it goes. I did it, I sent it, added back, da, da, da. And then he calls me up one day, he's going, we've got about four houses willing to buy your book. I was like, wow. And uh, so it, it came around, right? I mean, did I stop training dogs to write the book? No, I wrote the book in the nighttime. I trained dogs all day. I trained dogs half my life. So it, I, it was a little insulting for somebody to actually like take on that you know, you're not a dog trainer, you write books, you know, I, that, that sort of troubled me. I, I don't want to write any other books. I've been included in some books now, but you know what? I, I'd rather put my hands on the dog, on the leash, on the chicken and the clicker, you know, yeah. than a pet, right? It's just it's kind of like who I am. And then the rest, I, I don't know, I go around now, people, I guess it's because 40 something years, you know, I, ran into somebody and I guess I mentioned my name to someone and the other person turned around and said, you're Steve Diller, the dog guy? And I'm like, I didn't know how to answer necessarily. I wasn't sure I wanted to say yes. 
<laughs> and then you get that thing, like, you know, some, from one of those movies, I thought you'd be taller, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it really, it look, you know, some of the, like, celebrity, you know, however, like the TV stuff, you know, I never chased any of these things. I didn't go to, like, interviews for, like, there were no auditions. You know, somebody calls me up, we'd like to ask you about this, we'd like to have you on about that, you know, da 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 I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But it's not like I went to become like popular as a dog trainer. It's like some things happen. I think a lot of dog trainers, it just kind of happens. I think if we really queried a lot of dog trainers about celebrity clients and stuff, I'm willing to bet there's not a dog trainer that exists that don't have a, a pretty good list of celebrity clients. You know, so I don't, what, the ones I have, I mean, I'm grateful I had some. It was a lot of fun. You know, I didn't charge them any different than anybody else. But, you know, it's like, you can get a little starstruck sometimes, but everybody's got, you know, it's not like, hey, Steve gets all the this or the that or this. No, if anything, I get the grief. It's like, hey, you're a good dog trainer. I've got a dog and ate my next door neighbor's son. I think we need you to come <laughs> And I'm like, oh, no, no, everything you heard is wrong. <laughs> Whatever I can do to like, get out of it. It's like, you know, it, it's been interesting for me, honestly. It's, it's, it's been interesting. It's, sometimes it's fun, you know, um, and sometimes it's not. The, back in the, in the old days, so, you know, one of the other things that sort of happened to me, I feel like, or for me, I'm not sure how to put it, was um, the, the I started to hang with these dog trainers in Manhattan in uh, maybe it was 86, 87, like that, 88 maybe, I don't know, mid to late 80s. And we would meet at uh, Nancy Strauss's house. She owned um, People Training for Dogs. She was a pretty well-known Manhattan trainer, very progressive woman, nice lady, good dog trainer. And she would have people come to her house one night a month and sit around and just talk dogs it was really nice but it started to get crowded in her, in her little place and the ASPCA in Manhattan offered us up their library so we started doing it at the library the next thing you know they're like they're making plans you know and they're like okay we're gonna make a society and they had the Society of North American Dog Trainers which was cool at the time Brian Kilcommons was the president and Mordecai Siegel was the vice president they had the society going. This was going so well, a lot of dog trainers. Then they started coming from everywhere, around the country, around the world, people getting in. So they changed the organization to the Society of North American Dog Trainers. <laughs> Probably should have been international, but that's what they did. And then when Mordecai Siegel was the, became the president, Arthur Haggerty became the vice president. And I'm sitting at a table with people next to me like, Joe Michael Evans, who was one of the monks at New Ski, and Carol Lee Benjamin, Mother Knows Best. I think it's still in print like 25 years later. Yeah. Mordecai Siegel, countless number of books. He was with, more, with uh, it was Matthew Margolis, who once was a New York dog trainer, became an LA guy. He was the partner to Morty. And I mean, every, every place I would turn and look, I'm looking at the people whose books that I, I kind of teethed on these books when I was a kid, you know, or maybe not so much a kid in some cases, right? But these people are now hanging with me here. I was like, I was having a blast. It was very nice. And I love talking to them. And they didn't mind listening to me a little bit and looked at just about my experience. And then after Morty was the president, Haggerty became the president. And I got the vice president spot. I was like, wow, I'm moving right up the chain here. And all I'm doing is sitting around. You know, I mean, I offered up, a, everybody did a lot. Every month someone would offer up a lecture. And we've had these people that would come, like Steve White. We had so many, like, like super high powered. I want to say Lindsay was, came at one point, but I'd have to check my records on that. I actually keep the, the, I got a folder from back in the day with all these amazing people who showed up to lend their expertise. They fly in just to do this. And things were beautiful. I became the president. I mean, I had a great year. Larry Bird became the vice president. He's a Long Island guy. He became the president. Then Jack Schultz from the A. I mean, the thing lasted for a while. We developed a test. We had a, a three-portion test for dog trainers, written, oral, and practical. 
So we pick the dogs the day of the test from the shelter, right out of there, go in the back, grab a dog, taking a level one test, we're gonna grab a level one dog for you, show us, show us what you got. And it was, I thought it was terrific. Um, we had to manipulate ourselves around to who would give these tests as the certifying body, which was, you know, I became part of that too, with Joe Evans, which was a, a joy for me. Um, and I think it was fair. I think it was really fair. Then Ian Dunbar, we all know him, you know, he's a pretty famous guy. Um, rather than join the Society of North American Dog Trainers, he developed the APDT and there was some, we had a little conflict right there. You know, we had some conflict because they clearly had an agenda in terms of technique and we were the open-minded group, except that we didn't stay open-minded. It, it, it changed. It kind of, because now came this, let's call it new training. And there was the new training and the old training. And there was the new thoughts and the old thoughts and very difficult to put these together you know we had some trouble in the room and when you put a bunch of dog trainers in the same room every month the hackles start to go up <laughs> the hackles go up. I, I mean we had a guy i think he was russian trainer he used to bring his roddy leave it in the car now we're at the aspca in manhattan it's probably early october it's an evening we're in the library and an ASPCA officer walks in and says, one of you guys have a Rottweiler in the car? And the Russian trainer said, yeah, me. And the guy said, well, there's no water in there. And you, know, you can't really leave him in the car alone like that. And the Russian said, it's not hot out. The dog has been with me all days, had plenty of water. The dog is fine. The officer said, he's not fine. You got to go get him out of there or I'll get him out of there. And the Russian said, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and the dog stayed where he was. But, you know, this is uh, just giving you an idea, a sample, a little sample. Right. What was in that room? Because I had, we had others that were so interested in everything new and positive. And then we had this, you know, this guy was like, go ahead, try and open the door, see how it goes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, our organization sort of fizzled because of all of that, you know, all of that. But while we were together, I was now again, so when I was in the veterinary industry, I was surrounded by board certified professional uh, practitioners, neurology, orthopedics, all that. And as I got rotated around, I got to work with some like amazingly gifted veterinarians. Now I'm at the society there and I'm sitting around dog trainers that are, I just like, I'm not going to say I drooled, but almost, you know, it was that like exciting and stuff. So, I, you know, I had different new, new and, and fabulous friends, and, but I always felt the, the pull, you know, there's because you know, I wanted to be as positive as these guys. And I also wanted to have some of the skill sets that some of these guys definitely had. I've watched these people train, right? I know what they can give me. I hear what you say, and I like it. I know what they can do. And I, and I was in that place. So I, I was in a Schutzen club for a while. You know, much of that tended to be compulsive until some of the members came from the other side and said, we could probably train some of these exercises in a much more motivational way. And we started to fool around with that, which was great, but it also created conflict at the club, right? So not only do we have this stuff in our profession, I had it in my own life, you know, being it from there, being happy to bring this in, good for me, just makes me a better trainer, I feel. I would think this makes everybody a better trainer, but some of these folks, they don't feel good about this. They, they have their ideas. Everybody's got their thing. So somehow I survived being in the middle. That might've been one of the things you showed up to in the city where I sat in the middle of that. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it was a, uh, and I don't know, I don't want to say, no, it wasn't an e-collar workshop, um, but it was something along those lines. And it was, I like, I felt like I was in, 
like Congress because it was like half the room was Democrats, the other half was Republicans. But in that case, it was like half the room was a lot of positive trainers. The other half were a lot of traditional trainers. And, and by this time in my career, I was still somewhere in the middle. So, you know, which I, I feel I'm still there now. Um, Me too. You know, Me? and uh, I just, you know, I, I, it was good for me because I like hearing both sides anyway. So I'll tell you what, you know, knowing that I was going to moderate that back then, um, at the time I was training a female Roddy for two psychiatrists, husband and wife. And I, I did a lot of work with them, for them, with the dog. And just before that event came up, I started to feel the pressure of knowing that I'm going to have these two sides that are like polar opposite in the room and I'm going to be sitting in the middle. And so I'm thinking, what did Bonnie get me into here? Right. <laughs> so I called up the site, Dr. Mister. And I said, listen, maybe you could help me out. He's going, how? I said, well, I got to do this moderate thing for these dog trainers. And I'm, be I'm feeling a little anxious about it. And he says, would you like me to give you a prescription for Xanax? <laughs> And I said, no, I'm not calling for pills. I want you to behavioral solution. And he's like, he didn't really have one, but it worked out. It worked out okay. <laughs> anyway, but that's it cracked good. me up because, you know, that's telling too, right? Yeah. I, I, we have a prescription for that. And I'm like, all right, you know, I think I can work it out without. And I, I know that a lot of my cases where I might say to someone, you know, we may need to go to some pharmacological intervention here. And I know what they're going to say. I know how they feel. It's like, I don't want to do that. I, I don't think I ever had a client. I was like, good, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> We'd really rather not do that. I'm like, I'm with you. I'd rather not do that too. But let's look at the dog. Right? Let's look at the dog. How can we best help the dog? So, you know, it's been an interesting. I just, I, I feel that, and I suggested this for the forum, right, about books. I mean, I've got a lot of books. A lot of these books, they're old, they're old, but that doesn't make them worthless. And no, I think no. about how people really train dogs. I like John Holmes. Are you familiar with him? The yeah. farmer's dog. I mean, you know, he's a guy who used a stick, right? He used a stick. And he loved his dogs to death. He wasn't an angry man, but it's what he knew. Um, uh, some of the textbooks, the old behavior textbooks, even Catherine Haupt, who is the veterinary behaviorist at Cornell, wrote a textbook. Um, and when you start reading the history of behavior and animals and stuff, and they talk about Africa, they talk about wildebeest, buffalo, and how are these people going to manage these gigantic animals in, in terms of herds? And well, they would run around with sticks screaming, in t intimidating the animals, right, in some way to get them to do what they needed them to do, right? It's, it's all they knew. They probably could have did it with food, but, you know, who was thinking, you know? <laughs> running around in grass skirts, for God's sake, you know, with sticks in their hand. So, but it started somewhere, right? I mean, we are thing with communication and relationship. I mean, we've had these things from the beginning of time with animals. It's just how we perceive how we go about it is changing because the, the animals themselves have become different in our lives, at least here in, the, in, in this part of the world, I would say, they're not employees, they're family members, right? That's, the, it's not like they, it once was when you read old, old books, or even if you move into the 50s and 60s with like Blanche Saunders, um, the first lady of dog obedience, they call her, she was a little rough, or, you know, walkies, right? That, you know, <laughs> You know, you go to the British side, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, I used to watch that on Channel 13, you know. And, but it was, it was always that, nah, 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 you know, the Mickey Mouse voice. But the hands were a little stiff, you know. Sit, boom. <laughs> what a good dog. You know, it's like, wow, wow. Come, boom. You know, okay, you know so. 50s, 60s, you know, was a lot of compulsion. And when I got my job at the dog training school and I said, is there any literature? They said, you need to read Colonel Conrad Most book, Training Dogs. And they gave me a copy. Um, wasn't long thereafter that I learned that that book was out of print. 
and it, it became like a really difficult book to get. Um, so difficult that Learberg, that would be Ed Frawley's place, the video guy, um, he published the book himself, republished it years later in a soft cover, which was really affordable. But, you know, I saw it on the, on the internet for if, if you can get an old hardcover book, you're paying a couple hundred bucks, you know, wow. it, it became, and it's, it's a hundred percent about compulsion, but the way the Colonel had it going on there, you know, he, he was very careful not to be cruel. It was about technique. This is what you have to do. This is why you're doing it. And then there was Bill Keeler. People went crazy when Bill Keeler started writing books because, you know, he was really in the writings. If your dog digs a hole, fill it with water, take him by the collar, dunk him. Make sure you keep him under the water until he thinks he's going to die and then pull him up and then dunk him again. And the next day, whether he digs or not, fill the hole with water and dunk him. You know, this kind of stuff, or if he eats a shoe, you tape it into his mouth. You tie him to the leg of a piece of furniture, no room, and duct tape it into his mouth. So if he tries to scratch it off, he'll claw up his face. He'll be stuck with it. And his attitude was, even if it was chocolate, something you love, if it's stuck in your mouth and you can't move around, you're not going to, that chocolate's going to turn rancid before you know it. You won't be liking chocolate for long. But this was his. And now I, in, in the early days, I would have my students, my animal behavior students, read it and write a report. And it would always come back the same. This guy's insane. <laughs> this guy's insane. But I actually worked with people over the years that worked with Bill Keeler himself. And they would say, oh, yeah, we know about the books. We know what he wrote. If you watched him work. The two were nothing alike. He really had a gift with the leash. He just, so, and I saw that myself with Joe Bevins, who was a monk. You know, they're very compulsive guys. I watched him work at Chihuahua. I mean, you know, on, on a leash, just amazing. So, with such grace and technique, it was artistic, you know, just beautiful to watch that stuff. So, you know, I, I, I've seen that training be wonderful for the dogs, for the dog's owners, for the trainer to aspire to be able to have that technique. It's like playing Chopin, you know, when you got it going on like that, right? To have some power in it, but to be able to temper that in a way where everybody's happy and everybody's doing the right thing. It takes an awful lot of practice, which is what kind of brings me to what's happening now. I, I did learn and I'm sure you know this yourself, if you have a dog and, and you feel like that's the right approach to take, leash, collar, book, you got to be nervous about your client because I, I don't know that I've run into any real clients that I could trust with a leash and a collar on a dog in terms of making corrections. They, they stink at it. They get mad. They get mad. If anybody's going to abuse a dog, it's going to be the dog owner. <laughs> They're going to say they're doing it for the dog. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and when I go to the dog's house, it's looking at me like, oh, you should have never left me here. You know? <laughs> and I feel bad. You know, I yeah. feel bad. The one thing that's probably not going to happen is they're not going to be able to abuse the dog too much if you're going down the positive road. Yeah.